What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to go through the ASVAB practice test one, and we're going through the arithmetic reasoning section. So for this first question here, we have Ellen with $36 to spend. She wants to buy lilies, and they cost $1.80 each, and we want to know how many lilies can she purchase. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the total amount of money that Ellen has, and we're going to divide by the cost of a lily, which is $1.80 each. So then here we just have to do this division, but one thing I like to do is 1.8, I could say 1.80, but that zero is insignificant. We can move the decimal over one place, but if we move the decimal over one place here, we have to do the same thing here. So this is just a nice little technique for dividing decimals. So then that would give me 18 going into 360. So once again, I could do 36 divided by 1.8, or I could do 360 divided by 18. This I think is a little bit easier. So now I say 18 goes into three zero times, but 18 goes into 36 exactly two times. And when we do two times 18, that's gonna give us 36. So when we subtract it, we're gonna have no remainder. And when we bring down that last zero, 18 goes into zero, zero times. Zero times 18 is zero. So we have no remainder. So that tells us that Ellen can buy 20 lilies. Now, one thing you could do to check your answer, just multiply 20 by 1.8 and it's gonna bring you right back to 36. So for this one, we have to know a little bit of geometry. We have an aquarium, and it's in the shape of a rectangular prism because they gave us the base length, the width, and they gave us how tall this thing is. So you don't have to draw this out, but this is just so you could visualize it. So what we have here is the base length is 12 inches, and then we have the width is five inches, and this thing is 10 inches tall. So for a question like this, you have to know the volume of a rectangular prism is equal to the length times the width times the height. So then what we do here is just take the length, which is 12 inches, and we multiply by the width, which is five inches, and then we multiply all of that by the height, or how tall this thing is, which is 10 inches. So now just multiply the numbers. 12 times five is 60, and then 60 times 10 is 600. Okay, when I get to this step, 12 times five is 60, multiplying by 10, Anytime you multiply by 10, you just take the number and put a zero at the end. Or if there's a decimal, just move the decimal over. So that tells us this is going to be 600, and the units would be cubic inches because this is measuring volume. So then here, that's just we just match it up, and this is going to be choice C. Okay, so this is a very, very wordy word problem. So we have some, uh, some guy turns in a woman's handbag to the lost and found at some large downtown store. So the man tells the clerk that... Um, that there's a ton of stuff in this bag. Let's see. So he estimates that the handbag is worth, oh, here we go. The handbag is worth $1.50. And inside the bag, we have all this stuff. Okay. And this is how much all of it's worth. But the clerk is writing a report to be submitted along with the found property. So what we have here is what should the clerk write as the total value of the cash and property combined? Okay, so what this question is asking for is just how much is all of this stuff worth so that the clerk could write an accurate report. All right, so these word problems, yeah, you could read them carefully, but if you have to move quickly, you kind of just want to get into the real question, which is what is the total value of everything? So what we have here, the bag is worth 150. Then we're told that the makeup is 65 or the makeup case. Then the next thing, the perfume is 75. The earrings are 150. And then the cash is 178. So then what you want to do here is just add all this up. So 5 plus 5 is 10 and plus another 8 is 18. So we write our 8, we carry the 1, and now we have 1 plus 5 is 6, plus another 6 is 12, plus 7 is 19, plus 5 is 24, and then 24 plus 7 is 31. So we write our 1 and we carry the 3, and we have 3 plus 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5, plus another 1 is 6. So this is going to work out to 618. So for the next set of questions, we got to use this information for all the questions. So what we have here is the cost of movie theater tickets for adults and for kids 12 and under. And then on Saturday and Sunday until 4 p.m., there's a matinee price. So the tickets are going to be cheaper. For adults, they're going to go down to $5.50. And then they're going to go down to $3 for kids 12 and under. And they also tell us their special group discounts are available for groups of 30 or more. But we want to say... Well, for this question, we want to know which of these can be determined from the information given in the passage. So we're taking this from information given in the passage, which means we can't assume anything. So for choice A, we could determine how much it will cost a family of four 
to buy movie theater tickets on Saturday afternoon. This we can't determine because what we don't know is we don't know how old the people in the family are. If it's a family of four, chances are that means there's going to be two kids there, but we don't know if these kids are going to be under 12 or over 12. So this we cannot determine unless we know how old everybody is. So for B, the difference between the cost of two movie theater tickets on Tuesday night and the cost of one ticket on Sunday at 3 p.m. So this one we could also get rid of because, once again, you need to know the age of the people involved. So we can't determine this specific information unless we specifically know what kind of tickets we're purchasing. If it, is it for adults or is it for kids under 12 or 12 and under? So now for C, how much movie theater tickets will cost each person if he or she is part of a group of 40 people. So they said that there are special groups, there are group discounts available for groups of 30 or more, but they didn't tell you how much the discount is. So this we can't. So just by process of elimination, it's going to be choice D. But let's just read this to be sure. So we could tell the difference between the cost of a movie theater ticket for an adult on Friday night. So a Friday night ticket's gonna cost 750. And a movie theater ticket for a 13-year-old, which counts as an adult, on a Saturday afternoon at 1. So the matinee price for adults is five fifty. So the difference between these two is just going to be $2. So yeah, that's something we could actually determine. So for question 5 here, we have the Reeves family include one adult. So we have one adult. And we have... And I'll just kind of tally it up here. So we have adults... And we have a 15-year-old, which counts as an adult because they're over 12. And then they have a 12-year-old and an 11-year-old. So what that tells us that in terms of the kid tickets, so I'll just write kids. They're going to pay for two adult tickets and two kid tickets. See here, we have one adult and one 15-year-old. And then we have two people that are 12 and under. So now we want to know how much would the Reeves family save by going to a Saturday matinee instead of a regular price movie at 7 p.m.? Well, two adult tickets tells us we would be paying $7.50. We'd be paying that twice. And when we add this up, this is going to work out to $15 if we do the long addition. Or you could just do times two. But two kid tickets, two kid tickets, they're $5 each. So two kid tickets are going to be $10. So that means their total, their total bill as of now is going to be $25. But we want to know how much money would the Reeves family save by going to a Saturday matinee instead. Well, the 750 tickets are going to drop down to 550. So there's two tickets for 550. And then the kid tickets are going to drop down to three dollars. So all we're going to do is just total this up and subtract it from this total. So now we have zero, five plus five is ten. So we carry the one. So now we have five plus five is ten plus one is eleven. And then plus 3 is going to give us 14, plus another 3 is going to give us 17. So if we subtract 17 here, we want to know how much would the Reeves family save. That's how much we want to know. How much would they save? So when we subtract this here, this is going to give us a difference of $8. So they're going to save $8. So let's take a look at this next question. So how can you find the difference in price between a movie theater ticket for an adult and a movie theater ticket for a child under the age of 12? If the tickets are for a show at 3 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. So if it's at 3 p.m. on a Saturday, that means they qualify for the matinee prices. So if we want to find the difference between an adult and a child under the age of 12 movie, what we're going to do is we're going to subtract these two. Okay, we want to find out how much cheaper is a kid's ticket, so we would just subtract these two. And this is not what the question is actually asking us for, but it's $2.50 cheaper. So we're going to subtract $3.00 from 550, which is choice A. So for question seven, we have, it takes a typist 0.75 seconds to type one word. So that's our rate, 0.75 seconds per word. And we wanna know how many words can be typed in 60 seconds. So here we have to be careful. The million dollar question is, do we multiply by 60 or do 60 divided by the rate? And for something like this, if you were to multiply by 60 seconds, that would not be the way to go here. Uh, so I'll just say this first. Don't, don't do this times 60 seconds because if you multiply, seconds times seconds is seconds squared, 
which wouldn't make sense. We want to know how many words. We don't want seconds squared in our answer. So we're not going to do this. So what you're going to do is you're going to take 60 seconds and you're going to divide it by 0.75 seconds per word. And there's a lot of ways that you could work this out. Dividing this by a decimal, I don't think is going to be that kind. So what you could do instead is call 0 0.75. 0 0.75 is the same thing as three fourths or three quarters. Just think three quarters is worth 75 cents. So we divide this by three fourths and we have 60 seconds divided by three fourths seconds per word. But when you divide by a fraction, there's a very helpful technique to know called keep change flip. You keep the stuff in the numerator you change this fraction, which means division to multiplication, and then you flip whatever's in the denominator. So I'm going to flip three over four to four over three, and I'm going to flip seconds over words to words per second. And notice now seconds divided by seconds cancel out. And then here I could do this two ways. I could do 60 times four is 240, then divide by three and get 80. Or I could just do 60 divided by three is 20, and then 20 times four is 80. So the answer to this is going to be 80 words. And we'll just make this plural so it actually makes grammatical sense. So for question eight, this is another rate question. So the average woman burns 8.2 calories per minute. And we want to know how many calories will she burn if she rides for 35 minutes. So we're going to multiply this here by 35 minutes. The reason why we're not dividing is, once again, we need the units to cancel. The answer we're looking for is how many calories. So at the end, we need just calories in our answer. So we multiply so that minutes over minutes cancel. Okay, we're doing the rate times time to say how many calories. So now what we have here, we just have to do the long multiplication. We have 35 times 8.2. 2 times 5 is 10. We carry the 1. And then we have 2 times 3 is 6, plus 1 is 7. And now we just uh, put a placeholder here. We're doing 8 times 5 is 40, we carry the four, and then eight times three is 24, plus four is 28. So now we bring this down, oh, we do seven plus zero, and we carry down the rest. But think about this carefully. Uh, how far up would this go? Just think 35 times 10 is 350. So 35 times 8.2 has to be less than 350. So the decimal goes here. Or you could remember that we ignored one decimal place. So at the end, we have to pay one decimal place back. So 287 is going to be our answer. For question nine, we get an estimate from Raindrop Roofing that it's going to cost $6,000 to repair Klein's roof. So we'll just write our 6,000 here. And then what we're told is that Kendra's contracting gave an estimate that was three-fifths of the estimate by Raindrop Roofing. So we're going to multiply this by three-fifths. And this is our dollar sign here. Let's just make this nicer. So $6,000. And we want to know how much Kendra's contracting is proposing that they pay for the repair. So we just have to work this out. Now, there's a few ways you could do this. When you multiply fractions like this, I'm going to call this 6,000 over 1 times 3 over 5. You could just multiply the numerators and denominators, then divide. Or you could cross cancel. So what I do in my head that makes me able to cross cancel this faster so I don't have to do long division is I just imagine I'm doing 60 divided by 5. And I know 60 divided by 5 is 12. So this cancels out and makes 12, but you have to be reasonable here. If I'm doing 6,000 divided by 5, well, we just said 60 over 5 is equal to 12. So if I add a 0, that adds a 0 here. 600 over 5 is 120. So 6,000 over 5 would be 1,200. So that's going to give us 1,200 left when we do 6,000 divided by 5. And when I do 1,200 times 3, here's another thought. I know that 12 times 3 is equal to 36. I'm going to leave a little space. So if I do 120 times 3, that's 360. So if I do 1,200 times 3, that's 3,600. So that's going to work out to 3,600. So that's the estimate. So 9 is going to be choice D. So for question 10, we have 30% of the students at a middle school. I'm going to write 30% as 30 out of 100. And we're told that the 30% are involved in vocal and instrumental music. And we're told if 15% of the musicians are in the choir. So what we're going to find here is we're going to find 15% of the 30%. Well, the 
is here out of 100. And just know in math, the word of means multiply. So what we're really doing is multiplying 15% by 30%. But 30% is 30 out of 100. 15% is 15 out of 100. So then all I want to do here is do 15 times 30, uh, which that's going to be a big number. This is going to be uh, 450. So what I'll do to simplify this, anytime you have trailing zeros, you could always just cross off trailing zero. So I'm really going to do 15 over 100 times 3 over 10. And if I want to, I could divide the top and bottom of this fraction by 5. So I could do divide by 5, divide by 5, and that's going to simplify this more. That's going to give me 3 over 20 times 3 over 10. And now from here, this is going to work out when I multiply this across to 9 over 200. But I need to know what percentage. And percents are always out of 100. So in order for me to make this denominator out of 100, I'm going to have to divide it by 2. But if I divide the bottom by 2, I have to divide the top by 2. So now I'm out of 100. And I'm just going to do now 9 divided by 2 is 4.5 or 4.5. So this equates to, this is the same thing as 4.5 percent, which is going to match up with choice A. Okay, so this is one of those very wordy word problems. So we have cable TV includes 16 channels, $15 a month. Initial labor, uh, the labor fee to install is 25. A $65 deposit is required, but will be refunded within two years if the customer's bills are paid in full. And now we have other cable services may be added to the basic service. The movie channel service is $940 a month, news channel $750 a month, arts five dollars a month sports 480 a month so a customer's cable tv bill came to a total of twenty dollars a month and we want to know what portion of the bill was for basic cable service well basic cable service we're told costs fifteen dollars a month so the fact that their bill is twenty dollars a month this is not including the deposit because that means like the deposit has already been made otherwise the bill would be more than that so what we have here is we're looking at 15 is the part. So we're going to do part over whole. So we have 15 is the part for the basic cable divided by the total bill, which is 20. And what percent does this work out to? This is going to be 75%. Because 15 out of 20 is 3 fourths, and 3 fourths is 75%. If that didn't do it justice, remember, percents are out of 100. So I could always multiply the top and bottom by 5 giving me a denominator of 100, and then 15 times 5 if we work that out as 75. So 75% is going to be our solution here. So more from the same TV question. So the customer's first bill after having cable TV installed was $112.50. So this customer chose basic cable and one additional service. What additional service was chosen? So for this, we have to take into account that if this bill includes the installation, remember, a $65 uh, deposit is required, but the initial labor fee to install is $25. So we're going to subtract. First, let's subtract $25. That accounts for the labor fee. So now I have 2 minus 5, which I can't do. I could do 1 minus, I can't do 1 minus 2 either. So I, what I like to do for questions like this is I borrow from that entire thing and make it a 10, and I put the 1 here. Now 12 minus 5 is 7, and then 10 minus 2 is 8. So that means there's 8750 left, but a few other things that we have to consider. That what they also have here, the customer chose basic cable and one additional service. We also have to take into account the $65 deposit is required because it's the customer's first bill. So we have to account for the fact that they put a deposit down. So we subtract $65. So that's going to give us a leftover of 2250. And now just think about how much is basic how much is basic cable it's $15 a month. So we're going to subtract the $15 per month and this is giving us a few leftovers here. So I could I can't do 2 minus 5 so I borrow and then I have 12 minus 5 is 7. So there's $7.50 remaining and that covers exactly the value of the news channel. So which additional service was chosen? The news channel was the additional service chosen. So for question 13, we have 100 shoppers, 80 said they buy fresh fruit every week. How many shoppers out of 30,000 could be expected? So 
if 80 out of 100 are buying fresh fruit, that's 80%. But if I simplify this, remember, I could cross off trailing zeros, and that gives me 8 out of 10. And when I divide the top and bottom by 2, I have 4 fifths. So how many shoppers out of 30,000 could be expected to buy fresh fruit? Well, we could just take 30,000 and multiply by 4 fifths. So for something like this, once again, the math I'm doing in my head to make this a little easier and go faster is I just know that 30 divided by 5 is equal to 6. So if I add a 0, 300 divided by 5 is 60. 3,000 divided by 5 is 600. So then 30,000 divided by 5 is 6,000. So I would simplify first. 30,000 over 5 is 6,000. And then when I multiply 6,000 by 4, same concept except uh, just a little different. 6 times 4, I'll leave a space, is equal to 24. So if I put a 0, 60 times 4 is 240. And then 600 times 4 would be 2,400. So 6,000 times 4 would be 24,000. So this all works out to 24,000. So that's how many could be expected to buy fruit. So for this question, we have a nice pie chart. 4,000 compact discs were sold altogether. How many of the compact discs sold were country music? So country music accounts for 27.5%. If you can't see this, I'll make it a little bit bigger. 27.5% of the people bought country music. So looking at this here, there's a few ways you could go forward with this. But remember, 27.5% means 27.5 out of 100. So we're going to multiply that percent by 400 because we want to know how many compact discs were country. So this much percent we multiply by 400. And now just simplify first. 400 divided by 100 is 4. So then we're really just doing 27.5 times 4. And if we work this out, 4 times 5 is 20. We carry the 2. 4 times 7 is 28 plus 2 is 30 carry the 3, 4 times 2 is 8, plus 3 is 11. And now just uh, be reasonable, 27.5 times 4 is definitely not 1,100, but we ignored one decimal place. 110 is very reasonable, and that's going to be our solution here. So we have a continuation of this pie chart uh, where question 15, based on the graph, which types of music represent exactly half of the compact disc sold? So exactly half is another way of saying 50%. So we really need to find which two percents add up to 50. So if we just go through this, rock and jazz. Well, rock is 45.5% and jazz is 7.5%. This wouldn't work because when we add these, what I'm thinking about right away is if I add something bigger than 5 to 45, it's going to be more than 50. So 45 plus 7, I don't have to find exact values here, is going to be more than 50. But if I did 45.5 plus 7.5, that's going to work out to 53%. So this is too much. Classical and rock, if we look at those, classical is 4.5%. That's over here. And plus rock, if we add those together, that's going to equal exactly 50%. 45.5 plus 4.5, if we work this out, we get 10, carry the 1. We get another 10, carry the 1. This works out to exact, exactly 50 the other ones we could go through, but they're going to either be more or less, so these are no good either. So for question 16, we have 220 people bought cars from a certain dealer. 60% reported that they were completely satisfied. How many people reported being unsatisfied? So you could find 60% and then subtract, or just think about how many people reported being unsatisfied. The missing percent out of 100 is 40%. So once again, if 60% were happy and the rest were unhappy, that means 40% were unhappy. So 220 times 40% is 40 out of 100. We could cross off common zeros here. So these common zeros cross off. We could also, it's very sneaky, cross off these common zeros. So then all we're left with whole number wise is 22 times 4, which is 88 divided by 1. And then 88 over 1 is just 88, giving us choice C. So we have this many students at a university, and we have 135 speak fluent Spanish. And we want to know what percent of the student body speaks fluent Spanish. So this is another concept of part over whole. So the part here is 135 over the whole is 1125 like this. So for this one here, uh, this looks like it's a little bit more than 10%. So it's between 12 and 14. So if you were not so skilled at these questions, um, you could always use like process of elimination. 
So I look at the hole here and I just say, all right, 10% means move the decimal to the left. So 112.5 would be 10% of the total. So 135 is a little more than that. Um, there's other tricks you could use here too, that 10% is 112.5. If I move the decimal again, 11.25 is 1%. So what I could do is I could take 112.5 and I could keep adding 1% until I get to 135. So I have 11.25. So this is 10%. This is 1%. And I could see already, I'm going to put a zero at the end. So it's 0 0.50. That this is going to be 75, 3, 2. This is not going to be enough. This is going to give me 123.75. But if I put another 1% here, let's see what we get here. If I add another one, then I'm going to tally this up. 0 plus 5 plus 5 is 10. Carry the 1. And then I get 6 plus 2 is 8 plus another 2 is 10. Carry the 1. So I get 3 plus 4 plus 5. So this is 5 here. And then I get 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, and I get exactly 135. So 10% plus 1% plus 1% is 12%, and that's going to be our answer. Of course, you could do the long division here like this, and do this the long way. Um, but I just think this method is a lot nicer. Remember, to find 10%, move the decimal over once. To find 1%, you move the decimal over twice. And then you could kind of just add these together nicely. So we have a rectangular community garden needs fencing to keep deer from eating vegetables. So we have 200 linear feet of fencing is needed to enclose the garden space. So that represents the perimeter. All of this is just shouting out perimeter. So if that's how much linear feet, linear means straight line. So we need like 200 feet going in a line around to enclose this. So which of the following could be the length and width dimensions of the garden? So just know the perimeter is equal to two times the length plus two times the width, assuming it's a rectangular garden. Remember, it's like length, length, width, width. So when we add these all up, we get two times the length plus two times the width. So now we just have to think which one of these will work out to 200. Uh, this is not gonna work because right away, I could see if this was 100 and this is 100, 100 plus 100 is 200, which is already gonna put us over the 200 maximum amount of fence that we have, okay? Because this would give us 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100. This would be a perimeter of 400. Too much. This is also a problem. 100 plus 100 plus 20 plus 20 is more than 200. This and this are contenders. So if I think about this, I could say 80 plus 80 plus 20 plus 20. If we add this up, this is 160. Then th plus another 20 gives us 180. And 180 plus 20 gives us exactly 200. Just to be certain that this is not it, I could do 50, 50... 40, 40, and if I add this up, I get 100 plus 80, which is 180. That's going to fall too short. For 19, we have a piece of ribbon, three feet, four inches long, was divided into five equal parts. How long was each part? So what I like to do for questions like this, three feet, four inches, I want to convert this three feet into just inches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say three feet times 12 inches for every one foot. Now, I always like to show the units canceling here. If I multiply by 12 inches over one foot, that tells me there's 36 inches in three feet. Now, you could just do in your head three times 12 is 36, but I like to write the units like this to show the cancellation of units. So what that tells me is that we have 36 inches plus four inches. Three feet, four inches is the same thing as having 36 inches plus another four inches, which is a total of 40 inches. And I'm going to divide this into five equal parts. So when I divide this by five, this is going to give me each part is eight inches long, choice C. So for question 20, we have a bunch of food options at a middle school cafeteria. So here are the three options. $2 gets you a sandwich or two cookies. Million dollar phrases or, that's a little bit of a trap. So sandwich or two cookies. $3 gets you a sandwich and one cookie. $4 gets you either two sandwiches or a sandwich and two cookies. So we have Jame, I hope I'm saying that right, has $6 to spend for lunch for her and her brother. And we want to know which of the following is not a possible combination. Oh boy. Be careful here. The word not is going to massively throw this off. So can Jame get three sandwiches and one cookie? 
Well, we got to think about you have six dollars. If you want to get three sandwiches, you can't. Um, what you can't do here is just buy the two dollar option because then that would get you a sandwich or two cookies. So you'd have sandwich, 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 but then you wouldn't get the one cookie. So that's not possible. If you went with the four dollar option, so I'll write it down. Four dollars could get you two sandwiches. We need to get to three sandwiches, so we're gonna say, all right, two sandwiches. But now what we want is a sandwich and a cookie. But that's three dollars, and we already spent four. We don't have enough money. So this one is looking like the one that's not possible. But just to be sure, I'm gonna go with uh, checking the others out. So two sandwiches and two cookies. What you could do for that is you could just do the three dollar option twice. Okay, so choose option two twice. That's why this one is possible. So that's crossed off. One sandwich and four cookies. Wow. All right. So for this one, what you have is one. So you want, let's see, we want four cookies. That means we do the $2 option twice and we choose two cookies each time. That gets us four cookies. See, so we get two cookies and then we do another $2 option. So this is two cookies, two cookies. And then the $2 option, but the, that time we choose the sandwich. So this one's out because it is possible. Do the option one three times and just make one of them a sandwich and then two cookies, two cookies. Three sandwiches and no cookies. Okay, so for something like this, uh, just do the $2 option three times and go sandwich every time. So this one's out. So A is definitely it. So we have a circular table is going to be covered with tile. The diameter is approximately 10 feet. And approximately how many square feet of tile must be purchased to cover the table? So if we have a circular table and we wanna cover this thing, so we're covering it with, uh, with square tiles. The idea is that we're gonna find the area of this, of this circular table. The diameter is 10 feet, which means the radius is five feet. Just know the diameter is always the distance from one end of the circle to the other through the center. And the radius is always the distance from the center to one part of the circle. So the radius would be five feet. And if you look, the diameter would just be double that. So the area of a circle is pi r squared. So that means what we have here, and I'm not gonna write the units until the end. I'm gonna have pi times the radius is five, and that's being squared. So this is 25 pi. Now we just have to see pi is roughly 3.14159, blah, 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 blah. It goes on forever and ever. But for this question, they round. How many square feet of tile must be purchased to cover the table? Well, I just think of this as 25 in my head. I say 25 times three point something is like roughly 75 plus some small amount. So I'm looking at these, the only one that's reasonably close to 75 plus some small amount is going to be choice D. All right, question 22. We have Mr. Beard's temperature is 98 degrees Fahrenheit. That is an awesome name. I don't know. I imagine Mr. Beard having a pretty awesome beard. So what is his temperature in degrees Celsius? Oh, and they gave us a nice formula. So degrees Celsius, we have five ninths temperature Fahrenheit minus 32. And I should have wrote that vertically, but whatever. We'll do this now. So subtract 32, you get six, six. So five ninths of 66. Now this you could do a few ways. Um, we could do 66 divided by nine first. And nine goes into 63 almost evenly, but seven times will get you close. It'll get you to 63. So that'll give you a remainder of three. And the remainder we write over nine. So that's seven and three ninths. And seven and three ninths is equal to 7.33333. Remember three over nine, is just a repeating three. It's because it's one third and one third is just repeating three. So what I have here, when I do 66 divided by nine, I'm gonna have 7.333 like this. I could write this as seven and one third. So maybe I'll do that five times seven and one third. And then what we could do from here is we could convert seven and one third to an improper fraction. So I could do three times seven plus one divided by three. I do the denominator times the whole number plus the numerator divided by the denominator. So that's gonna be 22 over three. So from here, I have five times 22 divided by three. And then five times 22, I'll just do that on the side. 
This is going to give us 10, carry the 1, 10 plus 1 is 11. So this is 110 divided by 3. And I could do another long division, or I could say 3 goes into 11 3 times with the remainder of 2. 3 goes into 26 times with the remainder of 2. So I'm left with 2 thirds remainder, and 2 thirds is just a bunch of 6s repeating. So I get 36.6666666, which rounds to 36.7, which is choice B. For question 23, all the rooms on the main floor of an office building are rectangular, and we have 8 foot high ceilings. Kira's office is 9 feet wide by 11 feet long. So we have 11 going this way, and I'll just draw in a rectangular prism like this, and then I'll label it. So 11 feet long, we have the office is 9 feet wide, and all the ceilings are 8 foot. And we want to know what is the combined surface area of the four walls. So we just got to be very careful here to identify the four walls. What we're not going to use is we're not going to use 11 times 9, because 11 and 9 represent the floor. So we're not going to at any point do 11 times 9. We have to, I'll just label all of these. This is 8 foot high, this one is 8 foot high, and this one here is 8 foot high. So I'll just go one at a time. Let's say this wall here. So this is also 11 feet. So you see that first wall is 11 by 8. So 11 times 8. And there's two of them. There's the wall in the back, and there's this wall here in the front, this 8 by 11 foot wall. And 11 times 8 is 88. So I have two 88s to worry about. And then I have this wall here and this wall here. So this is 8 feet, but this I didn't label in again. This is 9 feet. So I have 8 feet times 9 feet. So I have 9 times 8, which is 72. But there's two of them. There's this wall on the left and this wall on the right. So that's another 9 times 8, which is 72. And now I just got to add this up. So uh, I'm going to add all this stuff up here. So notice I got 8 plus 2 is 10, and I get another 8 plus 2, which is another 10. 10 plus 10 is 20. So making groups of 10 is really helpful since, you know, if you're not using a calculator. And you have 10 here, 8 and 2 is 10, plus another 8 is 18. 18 plus 7 is 25, and 25 plus 7 is 32. So this is going to give us 320 square feet. A trap here would be to consider the top and bottom. But remember, you're not looking at the top and bottom. You're only looking at the four walls. So for 24, we have a recipe serves four people and calls for one and a half cups of broth. So I'm going to write that down. We have four people, and that's 1.5 or one and a half cups of broth. If you want to serve six people, how much broth do you need? Okay, so for this one, you could set up a proportion. You could say for four people, you need 1.5 cups. So if I want to serve six people, then I need X cups. And I'm going to not worry about the units anymore. As long as the units are consistent, I don't have to worry again. So I'm going to do four times X. I'm cross multiplying. Four X equals 6 times 1.5. And I'll do that on the side. 1.5 times 6. 6 times 5 is 30. Carry the 3. 6 times 1 is 6. Plus 3 is 9. So 1.5 times 6 is going to give us 9. And now I just got to divide by 4. And I'm in business. X equals 4 goes into 9 twice with 1 left over. So I get 2 and 1 fourth. And that's going to be choice B. So we have Platteville is 80 miles west and 30 miles north of Quincy. So here's Quincy. So I'm going to go 80 miles west, and then I'm going to go 60 miles north. So that's Platt, uh, Platteville. How long is the direct route from Platteville to Quincy? So if I go west and then I go north, I'm making a right triangle. And with right triangles, the most famous theorem that you need to know is Pythagorean theorem. So if I write this as a, b, and c, I have a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Now, for something like this, though, there's a nice uh, bit of math to know. But I'm going to pretend that we don't know Pythagorean triples. You could look into that if you want to. Uh, I'm just going to use this theorem. So the hypotenuse here, I'll call this c, is the one across from the right angle. So I'll just plug this in. We have 60 squared plus 80 squared is equal to c squared. And now if we work this out here, 60 squared, I just think of this in my head. I do 60 times 60. When I have trailing zeros, I do 6 times 6 is 36, and then I have two zeros. So this is going to give me 3,600 plus 8 times 8 is 64, 
and I'm gonna have trailing zeros equals C squared. So this is gonna, when I add those two together, 3,600 plus 6,400 is 10,000. So then I take the square root of both sides, and I think here, what number times itself, and I could use the answer key to help, is equal to 10,000. And it's gonna be 100, because when I do 100 times 100, same shortcut as before, one times one is one, but I have four trailing zeros, which equals 10,000. So that's gonna give us choice A. A nice little shortcut to this. So I'm gonna look at one quick alternate way of doing this, is knowing Pythagorean triples, and then you're done in a second. So Pythagorean triples are just certain values that show up commonly in right triangles, but they definitely determine the sides of a right triangle. And one of the most popular ones is three, four, five. And if we use concepts of similar triangles, that means if I multiply each side by the same number, then that resulting thing is going to also be a right triangle. So let's say for a moment I go times two to everything. That's going to give me another popular right triangle. Three times two is six, four times two is eight, five times two is 10. So that whole 60 miles, 80 miles, whoops, let's fix that, 80 miles, um, 100 miles would be the result of taking the 6, 8, 10 and multiplying it by 10 again. Or I could take the original 3, 4, 5 and multiply everything by 20. So then I have 60, 80, and 100. So that's how I would do that with none of this. But uh, that's just like a bonus method to, uh, to use to solve this. Question 26, we have a builder with 27 cubic feet of concrete and they're going to pave a sidewalk. The length is six times the width. So I'm just going to draw a stretch of sidewalk here. And... If the width of this thing is w, the length is six times that, so we'll call this six w. And they also told us that the concrete must be poured six inches deep. Now, one thing uh, I noticed right away with a question like this is you have to make sure the units match. So this thing, yes, is gonna go six inches deep. And what we're told though, is that the volume is gonna be 27 cubic feet. And notice this is in inches, so we should switch inches. Six inches is equal to half a foot. So I could describe this as this has to be six inches or it has to be half a foot deep. So I'm gonna use the one, I'm gonna use feet because the units will match this. It's very dangerous if you start mix and matching units, so make sure the units are consistent. And now volume of a rectangular prism is length times width times height. So what we have here is volume is 27 cubic feet. And I'm going to leave the units out to the end because now that I got the units to match, we're in business here. The length times width times height, I have 6w times w. So I have 6w times w times half a foot. Now I'm leaving the units out so that it doesn't get too complicated here. But just note, because I made the switch to feet, I'm okay to set up my equation now. If my equation was not consistent if i didn't have matching units then i would don't ever say 6w times w times 6 because this is in inches not feet and it needs to match the volume so then here i have 6 times a half 6 times a half is 3 so i'm going to have 27 equals 6 times a half is 3 and w times w is w squared next bit of algebra i could do is divide both sides by 3 and then on the left side 27 over 3 is 9 and that equals w squared I take the square root of both sides to get rid of the square, and that tells me w is equal to three. But it's very dangerous if I like try to stop here. Luckily, three is not an answer choice to like ruin our day, but they're asking us how long is the sidewalk? And they told us the length is six times the width. Remember, the length was equal to six w, and we just found w is three, so six times three tells us the length is 18 feet, choice D. All right, question 27, we have a bunch of brands and we wanna know which one is the least expensive per ounce. So this is gonna be a ton of division. And instead of writing $0.21, I'm just gonna write 21 cents. So we'll make that a little neater. 21 cents divided by six ounces. So to find out which one is the cheapest, we're gonna find the unit rate, which means we want the denominator to be one. So that means we have a lot of division ahead of us. So we're gonna do 21 divided by six. Six goes into 21. Three times, that gets us to 18, and then we'll have three left over. But three left over is out of six, so three and three-sixths is the same thing. This is 3.5 cents per ounce, and let's make that way neater. Cents 
per ounce. So that's the first one. And now we'll just do this with the rest. I'll color code this so we don't mix them up. So now we have 48 cents. And let's just move that down a little bit. So 48 cents divided by 15 ounces. So 15 goes into 48 three times. We multiply, we get 45, you subtract, you get three left over. So three out of 15. So three and three fifteenths is the same thing as three and one fifth when you divide the top and bottom by three. And one fifth is the same thing as 0 0.2. Okay, so what I could do is I could just say this is three and two times two times two and two tenths. And 2 tenths is 0 0.2. So this is the same thing as 3.2. So the next one is 3.2 cents per ounce. And for some reason, I can't draw the symbol. So this one's automatically out because I want to know which one's the uh, cheapest. So now we continue. Let's see if this one eliminates the green. So now we're doing 56 cents divided by 20. And 20 goes into 56. That's going to go into 56 two times. We do minus 40. Oh, it's already looking cheaper. And we have 16 left over. I'll put a decimal and a zero so I could carry it down. And I have to put a decimal here. 20 goes into 68 times. So oh, here we go, 2.8 cents per ounce. So that means this one is now out. So let's see if the fourth one eliminates the one before it. So what we have here, and it's not looking like it. Point, oh, whoops, I forgot. We're not writing the point. 96 cents divided by 32 ounces. This goes in exactly three times because three times 32 is 96. So this is three cents per ounce, which means this one is out. The cheapest one is the third one, brand Y. Question 28, Belisha drives a compact car that gets on average 28 miles. Let's make that neater, 28 miles per gallon. For some reason I can't write today. All right, miles per gallon. And she must drive 364 miles from LA to San Francisco. And gas costs on average 485 per gallon. Approximately how much will she spend on gas? All right, so she's gotta go 364 miles. This is her fuel efficiency. And gas is 485 per gallon. That's so expensive. All right, 485 per gallon. So there's a lot of stuff we gotta do here. Let's think about this very carefully. If she gets 28 miles per gallon, and she wants to go 364 miles. We have to divide the total distance of the trip divided by the fuel efficiency. So we're going to do 364 miles divided by 28 miles per gallon. And like we said before, in a sense here, this is miles over one. We could always write something over one. And when we divide fractions, we do keep. So we keep the first fraction. We change the operation to multiplication, and then we flip the other one. So you see, when we flip the bottom fraction, gallons over miles, miles over miles cancels, giving us just gallons, which is what we're trying to find, is how many gallons does she have to buy, Belisha, if she's got to go 364 miles. And now we just do a little division. 364 divided by 28. 28 goes into 36 one time, and we do minus 28. There's 8 left. Carry down the 4. And now let's think about this. Four is gonna to be too much, but 13, I'm oh sorry, three is gonna be good because then I have 60 plus 24 is exactly 84. Okay, that means that Belisha is gonna need 13 gallons. Okay, but they're not asking how many gallons we need. Okay, 13 gallons, we need to know how much it's gonna cost. So now we know that Belisha needs 13 gallons and gas is 485 per gallon. So we have to multiply. We have 13 gallons times 485 dollars per gallon. And notice the per gallon and gallon cancel like this. So now somewhere on the side, we'll just do this long multiplication. I'm trying to think here, is there a nicer way to do this? A fast way? Well, what I'm thinking here, oh, I, I see a way. If I approximated, let's say I did 13 times 5, because I don't feel like doing 13 times 485. 13 times 5, if we work this out, is 65. So if I multiply by 4.85, 13 times 4.85 is going to be less than 65, okay? 
So just know 13 times 4.85 is less than 13 times 5 because 4.85 is less than 5. So that means whatever that is, it's going to be less than 65. And the only answer less than 65 is 63. So it has to be A. Otherwise, you could just on the side do 485 times 13. You could even put your decimal here, work that out, and it's going to work out to 63. So for this question, we have a cook spends $500 or $540 on silverware. Question 29, we have a cook spending $540 on silverware. And a place setting is one knife. So let's just write this out. One knife, one fork, two spoons. So I'm going to break that up. I'll say like you have to get one spoon and you have to get another spoon. So it's two spoons. And here's some important information. A knife costs twice as much as forks or spoons. So if a fork is X, the knife is twice as much. And it's saying the knife is twice as much as forks or spoons, which means forks and spoons are the same price. So we'll call them both X. So that means a place setting, how much is a place setting cost? We would have to add 2X plus X. So I'll just add them up. 2X plus X plus another X and plus another X. So this thing is going to work out to, I'll just say equals 5x. So a place setting equals 5x. And the cook spent $540. So I'm going to set 540 equal to 5x. And if we divide by 5, that tells us that one place setting, one place setting here, 5 goes into 5 once. And then 5 goes into, I, I could do this on the side. It's going to be 108, but I'll show the work. 5 goes into 5 once. I subtract, I get this, I bring it, I bring down the four, but five goes into four zero times. Zero times five is zero, so I subtract zero. I still have a remainder of four. When I bring down that last zero, five goes into 48 times. And when I multiply and subtract, I get no remainder. So this works out to 108. So this tells us here that the, the cook got 108 play settings. Last question, an office uses two dozen pencils and three and a half reams of paper each week. So that's 24 pencils and 3.5 reams of paper. If pencils are five cents each, so these are five cents each, and reams of paper are $7.50 each, so that's how much these cost, then how much does it cost to supply the office for a week so we look at this we say 24 times 5 and we carry the 2 is 120 so 120 cents is a dollar 20 okay so this is 120 cents and this is equal to a dollar and 20 cents three and a half reams of paper well we just have to multiply we're doing 7.5 seven dollars and fifty cents times 3.5 and let me move that over a little bit. So we have 7.5 times, and we're doing 3.5. I don't have to put the zero at the end because a trailing zero doesn't add value to a decimal. So I'm just going to do 7.5 times 3.5. And when we work this out, 5 times 5 is 25. Carry the 2. 5 times 7 is 35, plus 2 is 37. And now we'll make a little space here. We put a placeholder. 3 times 5 is 15. Carry the 1. 3 times 7 is 21, plus 1 is 22. So we add this stuff up, we get 5, 12, carry the 1, 6, 2. And then I just think 7 times 3 is 21. So with these decimals, it'll be a little bit more than 21. So 26.25 as opposed to 262.5. So now all I have to do is just add those two together. This is the cost of paper. And the cost of pencils is $1.20. So we work this out. That's 5, 4, 7, 2. 2745 this last one is going to be choice c okay well this is going to conclude this video on the asvab practice test one arithmetic reasoning section if this video was helpful please like and subscribe it really helps me grow the channel and if you got any requests just leave the topics you want me to cover in the comment section below and thanks for watching